Are Jehovah's Witnesses a cult? Listen, I don't want you to take my word for it. You shouldn't trust strangers on the internet anyway. I'm just here to present the facts and you can decide for yourselves. So there are a lot of characteristics of cults and I didn't want to cram it all into one video. I thought it would be better to break it into sections. So this is just part one and we're just going to be talking about how cults recruit people. So first we're just going to do a general overview of cults and their recruitment techniques and then we're going to compare it to Jehovah's Witnesses and how they recruit their members and then we can compare and see if they fit that mold. There are three main ways a cult will recruit a, um, a new member. So part one is picking the right target. There are certain people who are more susceptible to joining cults. Those type of people being emotionally vulnerable, strained or no family connections, people who have just recently lost a job, facing financial hardship. College students are big targets. Why? Because they're in that weird age range where they're transitioning from teenage world to adult world. They're trying to figure out where they fit in. If they're on campus, this may be their first time away from their family. So this is the perfect time for a cult to swoop in and say, hey, you're looking for a place to belong. Hey, come over here with us. You can belong here. So college students are definitely um, a big target. So that's just, those are how they pick their targets. Those are usually the people they go after. Now, part two, once they have identified you, they'll tap into your weaknesses and then they'll try to provide a solution to whatever problem you have. So going back into that people with family, strained family connections, they'll say, you know, oh, well, if you have issues with your family, if you join our group, we'll be your family. We can tell you how to solve this problem, that problem. They'll kind of fill you out and see what areas of your life you don't feel great about. And they will tell you that they can fix it. If you just join them, they have all the answers, they have all the keys, all the solutions. Step three is love bombing and isolation. So love bombing is basically the honeymoon stage of when you're being reeled into a cult. The members will just shower you with attention and affection and flattery. You will make what feels like instant friendships. People will rally around you and, you know, just shower you with all this love. They may fake mutual interest to convince you that, you know, you guys have all this stuff in common. You'll be invited to their meetings, which let's just, just for clarification, a cult does not necessarily have to be religious. It could be a political party. It could be a self-help group. But just for the sake of what I'm discussing, I'm more so talking about the religious side. So they may invite you to their religious ceremony and when you when you go to that first meeting you will be love bombed they will act like they have been waiting for you to arrive okay they will just convince you to come back and just tell you that they're so happy that you're there and so the the goal of that is for you to leave that meeting thinking wow these are the most loving people i've ever seen that's what their goal is to make to make you feel like they have something special that you can only get with that group most cults have a us versus them mentality, meaning they're the ones that are right. They're the ones that have God's favor and everybody else is wrong. So they will slowly try to pull you away and discourage you from hanging out with your family and the friends you already had prior to meeting the group. They will caution you and make you feel like, you know, you're on our side now. You're part of us. We're against them. And so that's part of why they have to love bomb and they have to create these instant friendships because they want you to feel like your your new friends that you've developed in the group those are your real friends that's your real family not the people that you know you've known all your life so that's just a general overview of how cults recruit new members let's compare that to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm going to be quoting right from the Jehovah's Witnesses publications, okay? The proof is in the publications. I'll have some screenshots up of the um, articles I'm quoting from, but if you wanna read the, the articles in its entirety, I'll have them linked in the description. So the two main articles I'm gonna be quoting from, um, they're Watchtower publications, which most people are familiar with the Watchtower. Um, the Kingdom Ministry, some people may not be familiar with. Um, the Kingdom Ministry, they stopped producing in 2015 and they replaced it with the Christian Life and Ministry Workbook. It's more or less the same thing. It's basically an instruction manual which teaches witnesses how to recruit new members. Um, it tells them what topics to discuss, how to present them. It even has like sample presentations in there which a witness is supposed to model their presentation after. It's basically just like a sales pitch. 
So it's pretty much the, bl the blueprint of how a witness is supposed to conduct themselves when they're out looking for people to recruit into their cult. Sorry, their religious group. You all decide if it's a cult. So let's just see if witnesses prey on the vulnerable, shall we? Let's look into their articles. So the first article we're going to look at is the Kingdom Ministry. Um, it was the July 2007 Kingdom Ministry. The title, the title of the article, I'm sorry, this article cracks me up. The article is entitled, Why We Go Back Again and Again. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all these articles in their entirety. I'm just going to pick out the gems, if you will. So basically, this article is telling witnesses why they should continue to go back and try to preach to people, even if the person has said, no, thank you, I'm not interested. So they're telling witnesses, you know, this is why we're relentless and going out and preaching. And, you know, they say it's because they love Jehovah so much and they want to tell people about him and they want to save lives, yada, yada, yada. Cool. So we get to paragraph five and this is where shit gets dark. OK, so I'm just going to read the paragraph. It says people also change. The Apostle Paul was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man. Likewise, many who are serving Jehovah today were at one time not interested in the truth. Some may have even opposed the good news at one time. As world conditions change, some opposers or those who were indifferent may be moved to listen. Others may be more responsive after experiencing a personal tragedy, such as a death in the family, the loss of employment, a financial problem, or a health issue. Listen. They're, the proof is in the publication. They said what they said. They are literally saying here in black and white, people who at one time may not have wanted to become a Jehovah's Witness may get desperate enough to join after they have experienced some tragedy in their lives. I don't even have any words. I mean, they said it. They they said what they said. They They are admitting that, yes, it is easier to get someone to join us if they've just experienced some type of loss or some type of catastrophe in their lives. Because people who have gone through something like that are usually emotionally vulnerable. They're really not thinking clearly. They're just looking for comfort in any way they can get it. And that's when Jehovah's Witnesses are trained to swoop in and pounce. I didn't say it. Their literature said it. I'm going to move on because I'm about to get mad all over again. So the next article we're looking at, it's another Kingdom Ministry article. It's... Um, April 2008. The title of this one is Comfort the Morning Ones. So this article is just an overview. They are encouraging witnesses to be there for people who have just lost someone in death to, you know, be there to comfort them and all that good stuff. So at first glance, it sounds pretty innocent. Yes, you should definitely be there to comfort people who've just experienced the loss, right? Mm, let's just get into the article. Okay, so I'm going to read paragraph Four. So it says, if a funeral or memorial service is being held at the Kingdom Hall, will unbelievers be present? Literature that provides comfort could be made available for them. Some funeral homes have appreciated having some appropriate literature on hand for grieving families. At times, funeral notices appearing in the newspaper have opened the way for writing a brief comforting letter to bereaved family members. In one case, after receiving a letter that included some tracks, a widower and his daughter went to the publisher's home and asked, are you the people that sent me this letter? Well, I want to know more about the Bible. The man and his daughter agreed to a Bible study and began attending congregation meetings. <laughs> it, it, incredible. It's, it's truly, truly incredible. So I actually, ashamed to say I used to do this. I probably should have said this at the beginning of the video, but I was a Jehovah's Witness for 22 years before I left, the first 22 years of my life. And that was actually a thing. Witnesses would go online and look at online obituaries, or they would look in the newspaper, and they would see someone passed away, and they would write letters to the loved ones of the person who passed, basically saying, you know, go to our website, or here's this article. Again, targeting people who are emotionally vulnerable. They're saying, oh, make sure you have some, some literature when you go to funerals because there may be some non-witnesses there you can convert. Like, 
it is sick. And just to be clear, the average witness has good intentions. You know, I don't want anybody to, to listen to this and to take their anger out on witnesses because my anger is not even with them. It's with the people at the top. They're the ones encouraging them to do this type of stuff. And it's, it's disgusting. It, it's actually disgusting. So we're moving on to um, the part about recruiting or recruiting where you identify the weaknesses of your targets. So um, another Kingdom Ministry article, it's um, February 2014. It's entitled Improving Our Skills in the Ministry, Making a Record of the Interest. So this is regarding when a witness goes to someone's door, they knock on their door, the person opens, they have a maybe a brief conversation. They're basically saying this is the type of records you should keep once you walk away from the door. So I'm just going to go, there's a, like a check, a checklist at the bottom called how to do it. And there's just some bullet points. So I'm going to read the bullet points. Um, bullet point one says, make sure that you have tools in your witnessing case for recording interest. Keep your records neat, well organized and up to date. Make a record as soon as you finish the call. Bullet point two, write down information about the householder. What is his name and contact information, such as his address, phone number, or email address? What did you observe about him and his family that may be significant? Bullet three, write down the details of your conversation. What scriptures did you read? What did he say about his beliefs? What literature did you leave? Record the time, the day of the week, and the date of the visit. The next bullet, write down what you plan to do next time. What did you promise to discuss? When did you say you would return? The last bullet point, and this is just my favorite. Update your record each time you return. No harm is done if you write down more information than you need. Um, I think a little harm could be done. I, I think harm could definitely be done. First off, this whole thing of you, you go to someone's door and the person at the door does not realize that at, from the time a witness walks up to your home, they are looking for things and they're making mental observations. They're looking for if you have toys in the yard, you know, do this, does this person have kids looking for gardening tools? Do you have flowers, you know, in your yard? Is this person into gardening? They're immediately looking for things that they can try to either fake mutual interest or, you know, pretend like it's something they care about just to get like on a common ground so that they can, you know, go into their spiel to recruit you. Or they're looking for some type of weakness that they can exploit. So, you know, let's say the witness walks up to your home and they notice toys in the yard. You know, they may reach for the pamphlet in their bag that's about family life. You know what I mean? So they're always looking for things, some type of opening they can get in and, and just say something that may appeal to you. And again, they are being trained from their leaders at the top to make sure that they have very detailed notes about anything you all may discuss. If if you open that door and you say, you know what, I'm sorry, I really can't talk right now. I'm caring for my sick mother. A witness is going back to their car and they are writing that down. And they will find a scripture or an article or something that they can, they, they will build on that and they will come back. And next thing you know, they have some article about sick relatives or, oh, if you join our, our group, one day you'll experience a world where people won't get sick anymore. You know, it's again, I'm trying not to come across as just irate, but it, it really is sick the way that they target people. So we're going to move on to the next item, the last item, which is isolation and love bombing. So this is another kingdom ministry, um, November 2008, um, titled Prepare New Ones. To face opposition. Now, this is in regards to Bible studies. So, a witness has gone to this person's house a few times. They've they preached to them, and now this person has agreed to study the Bible with them. They they have not fully committed to being Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're like, "Hey, I'll hear you out. I'll let you come over and you know do these little Bible studies, whatever." So, this article is basically talking about those people. So it says, when individuals begin studying the Bible and desire to live with godly devotion, they become special targets of Satan. Opposition can come from workmates, schoolmates, or neighbors. It can be especially trying when, when well-meaning relatives oppose new ones. New ones must understand that persecution is to be expected and that it is an indication 
of their becoming genuine disciples of Christ. At times, opposition from others may be due to misconceptions about Jehovah's Witnesses. Keep in mind that great joy comes from being dishonored, for being a follower of Jesus, and for obeying God. Assure new ones of Jehovah's loving support. Maintaining their integrity puts them on Jehovah's side of the issue of universal sovereignty. When you have a Bible study, you're encouraged to kind of caution them straight out of the gate. Look, your family, your friends, they may not like what you're doing. They may even tell you to stop. And, you know, they're already kind of putting that putting that wedge between the person and their family. They're already saying, look, your family, your friends, they may oppose you, but that just means you're doing the right thing. And so when a family member or a friend does come to them and say, hey, look, you may need to do some research on what you're getting yourself into. This person already has a defense up because the witness has already put that bug in their ear saying, look, your friends and your family might be against you. So they're already kind of isolating them, already cautioning them. You know, you may have to kind of watch out for your family and friends. And so you're slowly having this this Bible student is already kind of giving their family and friends a side eye. Right. And so witnesses are slowly reeling them over onto their side. And so we're going to talk about the love bombing because these two things go hand in hand because now they're they're now viewing their family and friends as the enemy and these cult members. Now they're looking at them like, oh, no, these are my real friends over here. This is where the real love is. So this is another kingdom ministry. I guess all of these were kingdom ministries. I didn't have any Watchtower articles in here, I don't think. Um, But the kingdom ministry, this is December 2009, impart your soul to your students. Um, this, this article was an absolute gem. Um, I'm going to read paragraphs one through three because it, it just has to be, it has to be said. In order to help a Bible student to the point of dedication, more is required than simply conducting a regular Bible study with him. The apostle Paul compared his relationship with those he taught to that of a nursing mother cherishing her children. We too are pleased to impart our own souls in order to help our students to grow spiritually. As a Bible student applies what he learns, his conscience will prompt him to discontinue close association with those who do not conform to Bible principles. Just keep that in mind. His family may disown him. (laughs) Who chow? We can help fill the emotional void by demonstrating warm personal interest working in the ministry near your student's home, why not visit briefly to introduce your service companions? When appropriate, from time to time, invite different publishers, including elders, to accompany you on the study. Also, soon after you establish a study, encourage your Bible student to attend meetings at the Kingdom Hall. This will enable him to enjoy upbuilding association with members of the congregation who may become his spiritual family. Listen, like I said, don't take my word for it. Y'all see the, y'all see it, okay? Y'all see it. Look, there's a lot to unpack here. I love how they say that, you know, a Bible student, eventually his conscience is going to prompt him to cut off people who aren't witnesses. That's basically what they're saying. Um, I don't really think so much as his conscience. It's going to be the pressure from the witness studying with said student And what you're teaching him, you know, he's going to be strongly pressured to cut people off. You know, let's, I love how they act as if these people are acting on their own accord. I mean, in a way they are, you know, no one's putting a gun to anyone's head here, but we're not going to act like there is not strong pressure and manipulation and deception at work here. Like we're not just going to pretend like that's not a thing. And I love how they also say his family may disown him. You know what? I'm I'm going to save that for another video because they have some nerve talking about families disowning people. Okay? And if you are familiar with witnesses, you already know the irony in that statement because y'all disfellowship of policies? Really, sis? Really? We want to talk about disowning people? I don't think you want to go there. But we will. Oh, we we will go there in another video. But I just thought that was cute. Um so yeah, they're already saying you know, your family is, is going to turn your turn their back on you because you're following Christ now. And, you know, this Bible student, you're going to feel compelled to cut people off who don't have the same Bible standards as you. And so this is where that's the isolation part. Then the love bombing part comes in. In that next paragraph about the congregation, you slowly start introducing them to people from the kingdom hall. 
And these people, again, they will be super nice, super warm, super friendly, and you will have these instant friendships. It, listen, they will rally. I have seen it. I seen it. Okay, I've seen. I've actually, I brought someone to the hall with me before. The kingdom hall with me before. Thankfully, it didn't go. If she's listening to this, she's gonna laugh because we always laugh about when I was trying to convert her. But when I brought her to the the kingdom hall with me, everybody just rallied around her and I hope you come back and it's so great to see you like how is it so great to see somebody you don't even know this you don't want this person from a can of paint but you're just so excited to see them like but yeah this paragraph is saying you know encourage your bible student to come to the kingdom hall as soon as possible let him meet these people that are going to be his new family like Get him around all of these people that are going to just support him and love him, even though his, you know, his family is disowning him and turning their back on him. It's some, all the manipulation just jumped out. It's, it's so manipulative. So that's all the articles I have today. You can look at these articles and I think we can all agree that the behavior that Jehovah's Witnesses are exhibiting is cult-like. Okay, it's predatory, it's manipulative. They prey on people based on if they're emotionally vulnerable, if they've experienced the loss. They, they encourage you to cut off non-witness family and friends and to make the witnesses your family and friends. I wanted to just find a few articles. I don't wanna bombard people with information. I don't want hour and a half long videos out there, especially just this early in my channel. But it's out there. And again, I will have all of these in the description. You can look for yourselves. But I think we can all agree that their recruitment tactics are, are shady at the least. Very shady and very predatory. So that's all I have today. Stay tuned for part two where we will continue the discussion on whether Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. Uh, make sure you subscribe. And thank you for watching. I will see you in my next video. Bye.